of being a sexually abused child caused me to bristle whenever my uncle was nearby. I couldn't say a pleasant word to him. I couldn't even look straight at him. I was defensive and critical every time he spoke, and he knew it. And I remember as an adult, he said to me, I know you hate me, and I did. And I felt justified in my hate. He was wrong to have done what he did, and I never let him forget it. And I thought my anger was protecting me. I'll never be a victim again. Just you try it. <laughs> but what I didn't understand was that I had become a prisoner of my anger. I read this article in preparation for today, and it says, why am I so angry? Bitterness and anger wake in me, slamming cupboards and doors, complaining and breathing heavily. I know and consider my mental anguish, and this anger is emotionally draining me. Why do I let it consume my life? Can someone help this burdened heart? Just take this frustration away for good. I want my life to be normal, but I fear it will never be. It's, it's like I like to be miserable. I can be so negative at times. Rage consumes my every day. I know in life, conflict is expected to subside, but this is not the way that I am. I hide it within myself. I'm tired of running and hiding from my past and my weaknesses. The root of all anger is said to be fear. What the, and she used an expletive, what am I so afraid of? At the end of the day, I'm exhausted and weak. There has to be a better way to cope. Anger. It's a very good way to keep people away from you. Just be angry all the time. <laughs> and that's what it did for me. My uncle never dared come near me again. Now that I was big enough to fight him back, he walked a ride, wide circle around me. But I didn't see how it was hurting me and poisoning my relationships. Because you know what? Anger can't be contained. It's a consuming fire, and it destroys. And the more you try to hold it within, the more it grows. And one day, I was talking to um, my first pastor about the experience with my uncle. And he heard how contemptuous I spoke about my uncle. And in that moment, he said, Florida, I know your uncle was wrong, but you are letting what he did to you make you bitter and unforgiving. And he said, there are times when even I feel your anger. And I was taken aback. I had no idea that the way I felt about my uncle was starting to transfer to other people. When you think one person is dumb and stupid and weak and all of that, all of a sudden a lot more people seem to fit in that category. <laughs> it's so easy to see other people's sins. We never want to see each other's or our own. I could not see the log in my eye. I was very busy seeing the log in yours. And I justified it. Look what they did. Look what he did. I have the right to treat him bad. You know what God calls justifiable anger? Sin. When we point our fingers at others, there's always more pointing back at us. You know, the hardest sin to give up is the sin of justifiable anger. When someone has treated us badly, been evil towards us, we're still faced with the choice. Am I going to respond like a baby, or am I going to grow up? Now, I'm not saying that when it initially happens, don't cry. That would be crazy. It's okay to cry. It's okay, okay to scream. Scream like a baby. Cry like a baby. It's okay to hurt like a baby, but it's not okay to always be a baby. And I struggled to give up my anger towards my uncle. He'd taken my innocence and broken my trust, and I was a baby. 
And my pastor kept saying, you gotta pray about it. This thing is a poison in your soul. And he kept asking me, you gotta grow. You gotta grow, it's gonna hinder you. In spite of the evil that he did to you, you have to grow past it. And he told me to meditate on some passages of scriptures that I'm gonna give you. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 3.1. He said there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill, and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And Romans 12, 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And I can stand before you, just like many of the people who said it today. God works in our heartbreak, in our tragedies, and in our losses. But we have to decide, are we going to hold on to the evil that was done to us, or are we going to choose to grow and allow him to bring something good out of it? This didn't happen overnight for me. It was a deep wound. But I knew the right thing, and I had to practice, practice, practice. I had to be in his presence and say, no, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you, over and over and over and over. And the images of what he'd done got to a point where he no longer caused me pain. Sadness, yes, that's remained, but no longer pain and hurt and fear and hate. God helped me, and he healed me. And I remember the day that Haiti, my uncle, was no longer a power in my life. And it was the day I preached at his funeral. He died of emphysema. And my cousins called me, his children, and asked me to minister at the funeral. And I remember saying, God, you have a sense of humor. <laughs> And how much my mother loved him. And her, she 
was by what happened with me. But she never stopped loving him. She just kept him at a distance from me. I told how he chose a beautiful woman, my Aunt Mildred, who was so gentle and so kind. And I said, nobody could be that who would fall in love with Michael Cleo like Aunt Mildred. She was such a fine woman. I remember her as a second mother, all of us cousins. We would just run to her because she was just so loving and so fun. And her children were just like her, my cousins. They are such fine, decent people. And I told them that they were the best of what my uncle had done with his life. <laughs> and I told them more than anything, my uncle wanted to be loved. And he wanted his life to count for something, and it did. And all the time I'm speaking, this other dialogue is going over in my head. And I was telling the Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you, the pain is gone. Thank you for showing me that even that deep hurt can be healed. Thank you for helping me to understand the power of forgiveness. Thank you for allowing me to honor him for all those years that I did it. Because now I can be a woman of peace no matter what anybody did to me. Amen. Thank you for that lesson. And thank you for helping me to show honor and respect and kindness so that my cousins would have a memory of a beautiful service to their father. And afterwards, they couldn't stop thanking me for ministering to the family. And I was amazed at what God had brought out of that evil.